This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great to have my co-host at large, Paul Bindig, with me for this episode. How are you going, Paul? Awesome. Thank you, David. Great to be here. I am uh, I always say this, but I'm going to say it again. I'm, I'm a bit excited about um, the guest um, this episode, and it's probably a bit of a fanboy moment for me. Um a lot of you may know Ellen Reed for her role as keyboard player with Canadian outfit Crash Test Dummies, who've um, recorded nine studio albums since the the early 90s. As an Aussie, um, their second release in 1993, God Shuffled His Feet, uh, was my introduction and I was absolutely hooked. I don't know, Paul, did you did it resonate with you at the time? Was it one that yeah, you were aware of? Yeah, yeah it, did, it did, David. I mean, it was, as you know, it was a massive hit here, that album, and... Uh, the, uh, the their single which came off of that was huge and very intriguing and probably uh, I had no knowledge of the band prior to that coming out and so it, as a young adult that was so interesting quite different and obviously the, the baritone vocals and the, the layers of the song was really interesting stuff so yeah I loved it yeah and I, I mean at the time I was working in a job that required a bit of car travel and I just I had that album end to end on constant play and um you know, I recommend an end to end listen to appreciate the power of that whole album. It is it's just great from start to finish. Um and, and Ellen's keyboard player um keyboard playing, sorry, was a major part of that. It stood out uh, right back then as, you know, really b- creating a lot of the um mood and emotion underneath the music. So it's a bit of a thrill to have spoken with her. So um as you'll hear, we, we talked to Ellen about a whole bunch of things and um we hope you enjoy the interview. Ellen, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Now, um, just before the show started, I think you gave me one of the best Canadian impersonations of Australian accent ever. Do you want, do you want to repeat that for our audience? Well, I, I, I did t- take a little bit of uh, Australian at school. Um, it wasn't a, a, a course that we had to take. It was an option. It was a, it was a free course. And it, <laughs> the first thing we learned was how to uh, say razor blades. And uh, you just say, rise up lights. Rise up lights. See? She's got it. She's so, brilliant. Brilliant. I can say razor blades in Australian. So that, that'll, that'll come in handy when I'm traveling there extensively looking for razor blades. <laughs> That's right. And look, ca- ca- Canadians and Australians tend to have a bit of a bond, and I think you've just increased that exponentially in these difficult times. Well, we all like Australians and Canadians like poo jokes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the tie that binds. Yeah, absolutely. We'll always have poo. <laughs> There's, look, that's an album title if ever I've heard one. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, again, thanks for joining us. And I thought we'd just kick off with, uh, as we quite commonly do, and just ask if you could give us a bit of a potted history of your early years. What got you interested in music way back when? Um, well, I come from uh, a musical family. My father was the organist at our church for 45 years. Um, my mother was the choir director. Um, my brother is one of those people who can just pick up an instrument and say, hey, what's this? And within three hours, he's virtuoso on it. I, I am not that way. So I grew, I grew up in a, 
in a very musical family. Um, and so it, it wasn't a question of, will you take p- music lessons? It's like, how early do you want to start? So I started with uh, piano lessons, I think, when I was six, formal piano lessons. Um, and I took straight through till I was about 16. Um, I did, you know, the, the Royal Conservatory. Um, it's just sort of a Canadian thing that, you know, you, it's all like you take exams and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And then I just got, I got very bored with the exam part of it and, uh, and uh, quit piano lessons. So that's about as far as I went. So you raise an interesting point there about the Canadian system is probably similar to the Australian system in that it's, yeah, we use conservatoriums and have formalised exams. And it's amazing how that system does turn off a lot of people from music rather than keep them in it. Um, well, yeah, and I think there's probably a lot more uh, music programs now that are sort of geared towards music enjoyment as opposed to, you know, having a career in music. And I think that's what the conservatory uh, f- focus is. It's like, are you are you good enough to teach? Are you good enough to go to mm. university? And um, it qualifies you for stuff, right, those, those programs, whereas now they have sort of school of rock kind of things where you just go and you learn how to play an instrument and you just have fun. Um, I was not... I was an okay piano student. Um, I don't read music mm. at all, really. It's it's a real struggle, and I play almost entirely by I play entirely by ear. Let yeah. by ear. Let's just be honest. Um, so I found the sort of um, having to learn pieces by sight to be very frustrating and caused a lot of anxiety. But as soon as I could hear it, sometimes my teachers would play the recordings for me. It was okay. I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I mean, and so you did well at age 16 to, to basically do all that and still maintain an interest. So what kept you going or what got you to that next stage of still being involved in music? Um, well, I didn't really, um, well, you know, I was, I was in musical theatre and stuff like that. I've always been interested in music and enjoyed music. Like any teenager who doesn't enjoy music is just gearing themselves up to be shunned out of school. <laughs> but um yeah, it, it was just such a, a huge part of my family and my my friends that you just you just didn't get away from it. Um, but I didn't sort of do it ag- sort of again until um, sort of on a regular basis until I, I joined the band in uh, 1986. Yeah. So I, I sort of, we got together with a couple of people and we we formed the band and then I started uh, playing a little bit more regularly. I think you're right we, we all do as teens get absorbed in different music what, what sort of things were you you know captured by then what were you listening to at the time and and did any of that inform some of what you played or or wrote later on in life? Uh, are you asking me what my in, early influences were? Yeah but also just maybe not stuff that even influenced you but just stuff you listened to and liked as a teenager. Um I was really into Aerosmith. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I loved Aerosmith. I think that's the only thing that kept me from being beaten up at school was that I was into a band that other people at school liked, that the cool kids liked. Um, I liked Aerosmith. I liked rock music, basically. Yeah. But I, I also I, I liked a lot of folk music because my, my family listened to folk music all the time. So um, I was, I'm, was then and am now a very melody-driven person in that I, I I don't like music that doesn't have a melody <laughs> or at least an interesting melody um don't really care about the lyrics that much um but yeah I listened to Aerosmith I liked Pete Townsend and The Who uh mm-hmm. Joe Jackson was sort of an important early influence really early I liked like Simon and Garfunkel and mm-hmm. you know musical soundtracks and stuff the stuff that kids usually like but nothing really going to be unusual there (laughs) no but still i mean you know nothing wrong with any of it either they're they're big influences for me um so you you mentioned ellen that you've been with the crisis dummies uh, and it's um named predecessor since the outset so tell us a little bit about how you came to join the band and how it went from there um well it's very boring i uh a friend of mine met brad who is our lead singer and founder um at university and and she, she sang a couple of songs with this little group that he had that played at an after-hours club in Winnipeg called the, the Blue Note Cafe. And she said that he was looking for someone to play keyboards on a, or piano on a couple of songs that they did. So she said, well, why don't you come down? And so I went down and I did an audition. It's like, oh, you play piano? Okay, I guess you'll do. And uh, so I played on a couple of songs. And um, 
I must have really enjoyed it because we never, you know, really started on stage until about three in the morning. And, you know, I'm a hardcore morning person. So <laughs> uh, I must have enjoyed it on some level. So that's that's really how I started. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, two or three years after that, that Brad started writing original material and that it wasn't just a, you know, fun thing to do on the weekends, pass the hat kind of thing. So yeah, I really just got lucky. <laughs> Obviously, you, you've been with the band since the outset, Ellen, and for all these years. I'm really interested in, I guess, the dynamic. Obviously, it, it's it's a it works well from a relationship and working well together perspective. But musically, it must work really well together as well to to keep you doing it for all this time. I, I think, and after thirty years, you sort of well. I guess we haven't been writing music for thirty years, but. Um, when you work together for that long, you sort of, your, your sensibilities sort of start to get a little bit more cohesive. They work together mm-hmm. even better as the years go. Um, Brad is, is a very melody driven writer as well, although he obviously focuses on, focuses on the lyrics too, but um, our musical sensibilities are, are pretty, pretty similar. Um, so he, his music is fun to work with. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it, look. It must be. And you guys, if we can talk about God shuffled his feet for a second. Um, David and I were talking before, and we we're just saying how in, in Australia, that that album really woke a lot of us up to your band, the Crash Test Dummies, and it was um, the the single Mm-mm-mm-mm was incredibly popular. But the whole album went 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 crazy over here, but also all around the world. And I'm really interested, and I know you uh, reunited a couple of years ago to tour it and celebrate 25 years of it. I believe you guys are playing it from start to finish. I'm curious as to your approach to the material and and your feelings about it in in all that time. Has it changed in any way or how how has that evolved over time? Um, Playing that record again 25 years ago, it's it's remarkable how sort of – how little that we've wanted to change it. There has, we haven't wanted to sort of do a quote unquote update of it. Um, I feel like it's aged pretty well. Mm. So it's not like we've had, you know, put a bunch of, uh, I don't know, pitch correct effect on us or whatever the, (laughs) whatever the young people are using now, (laughs) whatever the people who, you know, who are producing Drake are doing, we're not. (laughs) I don't know. Why does everyone use that effect? Um, but but playing that record again, it, it's been really kind of fun, and it's been fun seeing um, the people who are coming out. Um, you know, they tell us their stories about how important that record was for them. Um, I'm actually not sure if I'm answering your question. Yeah, you're, your question you're answering it beautifully. Thing? Yeah, it's, oh, it's, okay. it's, and I think you raise a really good point on it aging well because. Um, as you'll hear when this comes out in the intro, I was saying I used to spend a lot of time in a car and play that album end to end many, many dozens of times. And the sound selection, particularly from your your viewpoint, but overall, there's nothing, you know, it's not as if there's a Roland D50 Shakuhachi sound that has dated it terribly. It's all really sensible pads and pianos and stuff like that that stand the test of time. They, they were very sort of... Uh, I think they were beautifully curated those those pads and and I have to be honest with you uh, most of them Brad would spend hours going through different pad sounds it was it was right around the time when Kurzweil's became to be yeah. really popular and he had like this it was probably like 20 times the size of, that they are now and he would go through them one at a time and he'd you know say I want it for this song and I want this for that song here like he was very meticulous about picking different sounds for um, different sounds for that record. So every pad and every texture keyboard wise that you hear on that record is, it was, it was painstakingly picked <laughs> but, and most often by Brad. I, I just held the chords to be brutally honest. <laughs> and, but, and I know you, you, you're far from a gearhead, but do, I mean, for this upcoming tour, how much work has it been, to recurate those sounds, so to speak. Well, and I, I think I did mention to you, to you that I, I'm actually not playing keyboards on this tour. Oh, true. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. But the the man who we have playing keyboards, Mark Arnold, he's uh, he's playing a Nord something. Yeah. It's not the newest one. It's an older one, which makes it 
troublesome when it breaks down. <laughs> but he he can pretty much match like note for note the sounds that we get. Um, he spent a great deal of time um, sampling things and tweaking things, and um, he gets really good uh, really good quality sounds out of that. Right. So I just am really super relieved because that kind of stuff gives me an ulcer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize to any of your listeners who are, you know, avid gearheads and love nothing more than sitting down with a keyboard and a sampler or whatever and getting that perfect sound because I got no time for that. No, I've got dogs to, to walk. I've got cat to poop to do. <laughs> <laughs> We come from all different perspectives, Ellen, so you'll find that we're just as many who are like you as who aren't, so it's actually refreshing to hear that, yeah. so that's, that's, that's excellent. <laughs> and if I can ask another question about when God shuffled his feet, I'm interested in when you're making and recording and working on that album, do you go, oh, my goodness, we've just got something amazing here, or did it success maybe – shock and surprise you or what was the feeling like as you were putting it together um well when we made god shuffled his feet we had had a a, a fair bit of success with our first record mm. uh the ghost at home in canada mm-hmm. and so the record company and uh, the record company in canada and the record company in the states they were um encouraged to give us a little bit more latitude and a prob- you know a little bit more money uh, so we had a beautiful studio. Um, we we had way more time. Our first record was recorded in eleven days, and Brad had bronchitis for the entire time. But it took. We were three months in the studio with God Shuffle the Speed. So we had a, a beautiful time creating creating that piece. Um, you know, we'd we'd spend three days just on backing vocals, which was more fun for me than I can tell you about. But um, yeah, recording that record was. Uh, was a real joy. Um, but of course, we had no idea what was going to, you know, it, is it going to be successful? Is our single, which doesn't have any words in the chorus, is that going to bring us any success? Yes. The record company didn't think so, and neither did we. But we weren't expecting um, the kind of success that it had. We, we had hoped that we'd had the same or a little more success than we had with our first record. Um, but of course, we were so pleasantly surprised and, uh, you know, uh, honored to, that people liked our, our second record as much as they did. Mm. It sounds like what you did have, though, was the time and the resources to make it what you wanted it to be when it was finished. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Brad, he had less time to write that record, too. Um, so I guess that's a testament to his songwriting. And it, he, back then, was he was a tortured writer. He would spend three weeks on a lyric, you know? Um, so it was a, it was a tough process to come with with those songs but then when we had some time and and resources we were able to to put it together in the way that the band sort of wanted things and imagined how things could sound and mm. and i mean just as an aside ellen from listening to the album so many times i was convinced he was dying of lung cancer so time was the, the essence anyway based on some of those lyrics but <laughs> pleased to see he's still kicking all these years later <laughs> he, he seems to be still breathing and yeah. we're, we're glad of that <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you just mentioned, Ellen, too, on the current tour that you won't be playing keyboards. So um, for the sake of our listeners who may not have kept up uh, with the work of Crash the Summers, what, what actually are you playing? I am playing nothing. I play the tambourine and I sing backup vocals and occasionally I pick up the uh, accordion. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm not playing is because um, I, I get stressed out so much by doing all that stuff and having to come up with sounds and and the way keyboards are now where you have to load sounds you can't just press a button it's super terrifying for me and i'm too old to give a shit about it (laughs) so i'm playing tambourine i'm right up front i'm singing um and it's it's actually better visually for the for the live show anyway to have sort of the principles up front um shaken our middle-aged money makers. <laughs> On the subject of the accordion, Ellen, how did you come to the accordion? When you know, How old were you? What sort of got you into it? You know, your viewers are just going to think, Ellen Reed is useless because I'm going to tell you that an accordion to me is just a sideways piano. I cannot play the buttons. I don't yeah. play the buttons. Um, I, for the first uh, 
five tours, I used a, uh, well, first, well, for the first four albums, really, I used an accordion that was a student model that I bought from somebody's dad um, for, I don't know, 60 bucks. Um, and then that finally fell apart. And for this tour, I, I, I bit the bullet and I got myself a Roland XR1. It's, I think it's a, it's a nice little compact thing and it it plays strings and everything. It's beautiful. So that's what I've got that I, I play on the accordion for. Yeah. Nice. And I love it. Mm Mm-hmm. And I mean, just a little bit of a step um, step into your solo work. So obviously, in two thousand and one, you released your album Cinderella, which um, is an incredibly diverse uh, and interesting um, album. Um, how did you find the process of writing and recording that compared to the work you've done with Crash Test Dunnies? Dunnies. I just said Dunnies, which is an Australian okay. word for toilet. Sorry. Well, you know what? We've been called worse. <laughs> We've been called worse. Uh, the crash test toilets. Um, <laughs> the the writing of of Cinderella was um, well, it was twenty years ago. So I'm trying yeah. to think. Um, I enjoy writing music. I, I enjoy I enjoy that process. Um, the recording of it was tons of fun. <clears throat> what I um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the process. And you know, when some people, you know, when it, they 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 get a little bit of a a, a windfall. They'll, they'll go and buy a Ferrari. But I thought, well, no, I'm I'm going to make myself a mm. a solo record, and so that's that's my Ferrari. Even though it's not really a Ferrari, it's really just a Toyota with a good paint job. <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> and when do we, when are we, are we likely to see a second Toyota in the garage in the future? Well, you know, if someone wants to like throw me 20 grand to, to, yeah. to do it, then I'll say, sure. But, um, you know, when 20 years ago, I, you know, I spent X number of dollars and then X number of dollars promoting it and X number of dollars with a radio guy. This is boring for your listeners, but do, if I, and, and did I recoup that? No, no, of course not. Um, and I'm just not willing to, yeah. to go so deep out of pocket. Um, for for basically vanity, because I don't think that enough people would be interested in it to uh, to merit doing it. But uh, I'm glad I did the one that I did, and uh, yeah, I'm 54, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically dead. <laughs> no, another 50 oh, years no. yet. Yeah. I got a few years left. That's right. Um. So I know we promised we wouldn't talk about gear uh, at all. So, and actually, <laughs> you mentioned before the show you can maybe tell me about the, the the keyboard in your closet. So let's do that. Let's do a new segment. What what what's the keyboard in your closet? The keyboard in my closet. And geez, you like? Do I even remember? I think <laughs> it's a Yamaha, and it's got weighted keys, and it's got a like a grand piano expansion thing in it. And I got it 19 years ago and it's awful. (laughs) (laughs) I was actually thinking of getting, I know that there are really nice, um, like they're so much nicer now, the keyboards. I, I played one backstage at one show we did recently. I think it was, it was a Yamaha and it looked like, like one of those little apartment pianos. Oh, yep. It was really nice. But no, seriously, your audience, they're going to hate me. I don't care about gear. No, I don't know about gear. I just, I, I like it when it feels like a real piano and when it's got reverb on it so it sounds like I'm talented. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you do leak, I, I, sorry, Paul, I'm going to jump over your next question. But do you, you do, do, let's talk about your la- latest Crash Test Dummies album, which is um, about 80 months, two years old. And the impetus for that, because that's sort of related to some very old gear. Are you happy to sort of just briefly talk about uh, Brad and what, what, how he, what the um, inspiration was for the last album? Are you talking about Ooh La La? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, he he used this instrument or this thing called an octagon, and it's this thing, and it comes with these discs. And the discs will be entitled Big Band or Smooth Jazz or uh, Toy 
you know, monkey playing a toy box or something like that. They're all little themes, right? And so you put these big discs into this machine and it just plays these little little riffs, like uh, little loops. I guess it's like that's what it yeah, is, yeah. an old loop thing. And he, so he wrote the whole record using this optagon and sort of based all of his writing around that. And I, it, I think it came up, he came up with some really, uh, really unique and um, interesting pieces. Absolutely. Yeah, very, very much worth, worth a listen. And it's, it's not as obvious as it could sound as far as the, the, the Optagon stuff is built so beautifully into it. Um, you wouldn't even know that, that that was the inspiration. Yeah, extremely, extremely impressive. Ellen, over your career, how has your approach to making music and playing music changed, if it has at all? I think I've probably gotten a lot more comfortable. Um, in, in the early days, I was um, very nervous and anxious. And, I, I, you know, have I ever written a keyboard solo? Do I solo keyboards live? No, terrified of that stuff. Um, so a lot of my early playing w- is, is very safe um, mm. and because I want, I, I'm terrified in the studio of embarrassing myself or making a mistake and embarrassing myself live. But now, now, now I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. And I, I'm, I'm more interested in, um, more interested in vocals anyway. That's, that's the part where I have fun in the studio is doing the vocals. The piano part has always been stressful for me. Um, and, you know, that's part of the, that, that is the reason why we have a, a, a keyboard player with us on board now because uh, he just loves that stuff and he eats, he eats anxiety for dinner. <laughs> and, uh, he, he can have my share, man. Um, so I think maybe... Um, as far as playing the piano, because I, I don't, I don't play the piano live anymore. I think if I was going to do that, um, I'd, I, I don't know, I'd probably be a nervous wreck. Mm. <laughs> I'm the worst guest you've ever no, had. So, and I, it's probably worth, it's worth jumping in here, Ellen. So we have a mix of semi-pro, pro, but also amateur keyboard players, of which I'd put myself in, in that category. And I think you actually find that you're inspiring a lot of people to realize that everyone's winging it to some extent. So no matter how what your level of success, and um, unless you have done 10 years of training and consolo and eat anxiety for breakfast, most of us wing it at different times, and you're just proving that sometimes winging it works. And But you're also <laughs> under... I, I guarantee you're also underselling yourself, which is not a bad thing either. But yeah, so well, I, I think you're you. a great guest. Um, yeah, well, for, for, for what it's worth, I think you're playing beautiful listening to your recording. Yeah, so right. I, I, I disagree that uh, you're, you, you struggle at all. I think you're fantastic. But, but I was about to agree with David. I think your, your candor around performance anxiety and, and having to deliver in front of an audience, I, I would suggest a lot of our listeners share that, uh, that, exact, that exact situation to deal with. So you talking about it like that, I think, is absolutely wonderful because it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. We all suffer from things that that can challenge us, uh, and you and you're out there doing it, and you guys tour a lot, and you, whether you're playing keyboards live or not, you're still out there putting yourself out there in front of people, and I think we're it's all thing. terrified. That's right, yeah, for sure, <laughs> we're all terrified, for and, sure. And that probably links to the next question, so I'm going to feed right into that terror, and that is, do you recall back when you were? tending to play keyboards more live, some um, memorable glitches or other moments you had that, that you learnt from or maybe didn't learn from as a keyboard player? Oh, criminy, so many, so <laughs> many horrible, horrible moments that have been shared and stored on recording, stored on recording things. Oh, God bless me. One fancy one, one super excellent one was, um, I can't remember where we were playing, but like all of a sudden my keyboards were like the sustain just held. Oh. So all of my notes were running into it. And it got louder and louder and louder. No one could figure it out what was going on until, um, but I, I knew what had happened. I had kept my foot on the sustain pedal and I just let all the notes like blur together for, Oh, about 30 seconds. So you can imagine what that's going to sound like in a big venue. If you hold, <laughs> if you play all your notes on your piano, but you're holding the sustain pedal for 30 seconds. Imagine what that sounds like in a PA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> See, we all yeah, have... stuff like that yeah. all the time. Uh, yeah, that, that's my biggest fear, that and um, starting off in the wrong key, which I've done before. Oh, I've done that too. Oh, I've done oh that God too. bless. Yeah. <laughs> Look, looking, looking at, looking at a, uh, someone else on stage saying, the song that we've been playing for 20 years, what is the first yeah, chord? That's right. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> All the time. And you know what? I don't do drugs or drink. I have no excuse. <laughs> None. Yeah. But, yeah. Pretty much terrified all the time, but that I'm, I'm glad that I, I don't have to do that. And someone who loves it can, uh, can do that. But you know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful instrument, the piano. It is. Brad's actually taking piano lessons right now and he's, he is deep into it. He, um, is studying theory and, you know, he'll bring sheet wow. music out on the road just to look at the sheet music, even if there's no piano around. He recently, he's in a group of, I think, amateur people, people who are taking piano lessons. They just did a little recital for each other. Oh, yeah. And, uh, he's very hard on himself, but he's, he's actually got quite a, quite a good touch. He's doing these easy pieces, um, by classical composers. Um, and he's, he's doing fantastic. He loves it. You should interview him about keyboards. He'll, <laughs> <laughs> he would know way more. Uh, well, obviously he would know way more about, uh, stuff like that, but. Does yeah, he use a, you as a, as a bit of a sounding board or a mentor Ellen, while he's learning? No, no, he has <laughs> no, had no, <laughs> no, he had no influence on how I play the piano and, uh, uh, anything like that. I, I, I've, I've always been a little bit I, I play really loud and do a lot of arpeggios because it's dramatic. And uh, it, I, <laughs> it's a musical theater buffing me. All the arpeggios, all the way up the scale. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I am my own self. And, he's, and, he's doing his own thing. He's not, he's not using you as a mentor. No. <laughs> no, okay, no we're enough. just our own thing. And, and luckily it kind of works together. <laughs> I, I mentioned before about your touring schedule, you've obviously been very, very busy for a while and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of dates coming up as well. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, what are you looking forward to, but also just from a, an Australian perspective, I'm wondering if we might see crash test dummies in our country anytime soon. Um, well, we had said that we would never go to Europe um, mm -hmm. and we are <laughs> planning to go to Europe in May. Um, will we ever go to Australia? Obviously, we would love to because, you know, we've got a soft spot for Australia and we have a lot of Australian fans. Mm -hmm. Australian radio was very good to us. Um, there's just a lot of things in play. And, uh, you know, they're the same things for every band. It's just, um, is it financially uh, feasible for us to get over there? Will we, can we command the ticket price that will pay us mm -hmm. so that we're not in, the, you know, in the red when we, when we come back to Canada? Um, of course. It's just a numbers game. It really is. And I'm, I wish it wasn't, but you know, if you could just move your continent a little bit closer. <laughs> or at least, at least float the Sydney Opera House or something a bit closer. Cause that'd be a classic venue for you guys. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Oh, I, oh, oh, we're, we're not playing the Sydney Opera House kind of venues. We're, we're doing pretty small venues now. Uh, we're filling them and that's, that's what we want. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the hundred thousand festival, hundred thousand people festival days are are yeah. left in the nineties, yeah. and that's that's okay. And now our last question, Ellen, that we inflict on every guest is the desert island discs. So this doesn't require any keyboard knowledge, but just your again probably your influences. So five five albums that had a big impact. So I mean, you've mentioned things like Aerosmith and that, but forcing you to nail down five albums that you couldn't live without. Oh Christ. Um, <laughs> I would say Joe reactions. Jackson body, <laughs> Joe Jackson body and soul. Yep. Um, uh, the Roaches, uh, their first album at their uh, folk group out of uh, New York City, the Roaches. Right. Uh, Pete Towns, Pete Towns, an empty glass. Oh yep. Uh, the National. Yeah, oh, I yep. can't remember what it's called, but it's got all the squiggly lines on it. It's got uh, Blood's Bud Ohio on it, but uh, that one on it. Yep. And, uh, oh, uh, Gregory Allen Isakoff, um, the one that he did with the orchestra. See, I, I listen to all my music through my husband. He, he plays, 
he has introduced me to a ton of good new music. So I, I'm living in like a 1994 bubble music wise, but if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't know anything. But uh, yeah, this Gregory Allen Isaac, this Gregory Allen Isakoff young man, I'm quite interested in what he's been doing lately. Uh, I'll be linking to each of those. And can I say your introduction, Oh Christ is the best one we've had. And that's also the quickest choice of albums we've ever had. Usually people agonize over it. Uh, well, you know, that's the five that I would pick today. Yeah. Ask me tomorrow and they'll be different. <laughs> Ellen, it's an absolute pleasure having spoken to you and, um, yeah, hope the European tour goes well. Well, I hope it goes at all without getting too tropical. Yeah, the, we're, uh, you know, I'm watching, um, you know, my Twitter feed today about all the acts that are postponing and cancelling mm. and uh, I haven't heard anything uh, from our higher-ups yet. But if we do end up postponing, we'll we'll announce that fast. But yeah, yeah. because we're we're at this like we start we go to the states in the middle of April, and like I think the next the next week or so will will it'll play itself out and we'll find out what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, looking forward to it if we if we do get over there for sure. And there we go. So, look, that was a bit of an interesting one, Paul, as far as, um, as I said to Ellen herself, I think she's underselling herself, but as much as she believed she wasn't a good guest, I think she was an excellent guest. I couldn't agree more, and I wasn't being nice when I said I, I was actually so happy with how candid she was about perhaps some of her performance anxiety issues or whatever, because I'm, I'm willing to bet there's, there's a lot of keyboard players out there, and, and I'll definitely number myself as one of them. Well, you do get quite stressed having to perform for an audience, and, and it can be quite an emotional roller coaster. So, I reckon good on her for having the courage to be, be honest about that. Yeah, and I, I said there's some severe underselling there because she, I mean her stuff on all their albums is is brilliant. Oh, she can play. She can yeah, play. No, pro- no problem there. Yeah, <laughs> I would happily be mentored. Um, so yeah, no, that was re- really really useful. I, I really enjoyed that. So. Um, Keyboard Chronicles will obviously be back in a fortnight or so, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. So our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com and we're on Facebook at forward slash keyboard chronicles or on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash the keyboard chr1. If you'd like good old fashioned email, then we always love to hear from you at editor at keyboard chronicles.com. Um, a huge thank you again, Paul, for joining me this episode. We'll see you again soon. Yeah, thanks, David. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to co-host. And most importantly, thanks to you for listening and hope to see you back here next episode. Mm-hmm.